So Lord, as we look to your word now, we pray for you to apply it to our hearts. Help us to know exactly what you're trying to tell us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're getting close to the end of our look at 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 4, picking it up in verse 6. So if you have a Bible, that's where you turn. If you want to follow along in a Bible and you don't have one, well, you can raise your hand and we'll either bring one to you or you can feel free to get up and pick one up off the back table. Do you have any takers for that that want to follow along? Okay. Once you find 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you want to mark that with your finger and turn more toward the back of the Bible and go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, what we pastor types call the Hall of Faith. If you want to find Hebrews 11 and mark that, we'll be turning to that later in the sermon. So that way, if you want to follow along, it'd be easier for you to find it. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, and I'm going to read this first. The date was May 29th, 2011. On that day, Dale Earnhardt Jr. was rounding the last lap at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. It looked like it was destiny. You could just imagine the script that was being written. It was Memorial Day. He was being sponsored by the National Guard, and he was finally going to win for the first time in 105 races. The fans were hysterical, stomping and cheering louder and louder. The moment promised much celebration of patriotism as Dale Earnhardt Jr. came around the backstretch of the Coca-Cola 600. Then, suddenly, it was over. The gas tank of the Chevrolet ran dry, and Kevin Harvick sped right around him and took the victory. The race was lost because Dale Earnhardt Jr. ran out of gas on the last lap of his race. So there's an encouragement in here for us. Don't run out of gas on the last lap of your race. Paul warns us in Galatians 6, verse 9 in the NIV, And let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus told the Ephesian church that had fallen behind in their race to get up and repent and do the things you did at first. So today we'll see why Paul could say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In fact, I call this message, How Does Your Fuel Gauge Read? I'm going to ask you this, does it read full? Or does it read empty? Let's find out. Verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So he starts out in verse 6 saying, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. This is an interesting concept to me because the basic idea of a drink offering is to literally have a drink and pour part of it or all of it on the ground, on an altar, or on the item that's being sacrificed. Now with a drink offering, you're offering the poured out part to God. You're sacrificing that part. You can't get it back once it's poured out. You ever notice that? Maybe you have a soda, glass of tea, cup of coffee, and you don't want to drink it anymore. So you open the car door, take the lid off, and pour it out. And if you're on a dirt road or something, try to get it back after you've poured it out. <laughs> it's like the ground drinks it. It always seems, you ever notice the ground almost always seems to be thirsty? And then you just, just takes it up. It's gone. And by the way, a drink offering is not knocking over a drink and spilling it. Saying, oops, can't get it back. Well, that's yours, God. You know, it's not a mistake. This is something you plan. This is something you're offering to him. The idea of a drink offering is first mentioned in Genesis 35, verse 14, when God is reminding Jacob he was now going to be called Israel and that many nations would come from him and that the land that God gave to Abraham and to Isaac he now gave to him. So 35 verse 14 of Genesis says, So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, where God talked with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured 
oil on it. More sacrifices are described in Exodus chapter 29, verse 40. With the one lamb shall be a one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. You're like, I don't have any measuring cups that say hin on them in my kitchen. What is that? Well, hin is a big measurement. It's, it's approximately a gallon. I read some commentators estimated up to a gallon and a half of U.S. measures. So that's quite a bit. Think about a gallon of milk in the plastic jug, you know, that's a lot of fluid. It's no small amount. In 2 Samuel 23, verses 15 through 17, King David is with some of his men in a cave overlooking Bethlehem, which at that time was under Philistine control. And it was probably hot in the cave. David was really thirsty. So we'll pick up the story there. Verse 15, and David said with longing, oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. David grew up there. He probably drank out of it a lot. It was really refreshing. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. These guys risked their lives to break through enemy lines to get their commander a drink of water from a certain well. <laughs> These guys really loved him. So what does David do? Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, we risk our lives, and you go and dump it on the ground? But wait, there's more. And he said, far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. So David not only loved God, he proved his love by making an offering, not based on the abundance of what he had, but what he lacked. See, it's easy to give God from our abundance. If you have $100,000 and you give God $1,000, whoa, he gave $1,000. Yeah, and he has 999 <laughs> or, uh, you know what I'm saying, math, not even once for me, but he still has a lot left over. <laughs> 99,999. I had to do the equation in my brain. But on the fly, it's on the fly. Speaking of flies, sorry about that. They're in the building. But anyway, squirrel, I told you. But giving to God when we can least afford it shows that we place God ahead of everything else in our lives. It also shows that we have faith in God to meet and supply all our needs. Even if we give out of our lack, he can make up for that. We trust him. So what need does God have of water? None. He doesn't have any need at all, but David poured it out. That's not why David offered it to him. With this simple act of faith and devotion, David demonstrated how much he loved God and how much he trusted God. And his friends who brought their gift to him, David paid them the highest honor by passing it along to the Lord. So instead of being mad as I portrayed it, to get a laugh, which worked, by the way, thank you, but uh, they would have been honored. Wow, he used it, our gift to him, he used it as a sacrifice to God. That's actually pretty special. David did not miss this opportunity to worship his Lord. In the book of Psalms, there's a psalm written in prophecy about the Messiah whom the Bible identifies as Jesus, who is always our best example. And it describes in amazing detail what happened to Jesus on the cross. Now, that's not hard to do after the fact. It's pretty easy to describe something in great detail after it's happened. But how about this? Psalm 22 was written just about a 1,000 years before Jesus was crucified. And if you ever read it, it's like a newspaper account of what happened, right down to them gambling for his food, or for his food, for his clothes, all kinds. I mean, it's just, I don't want to give it away. So read it, Psalm 22, but not right now because I'm talking about something else. But, and it was written at least 400 years before crucifixion was even invented as a torture. But Psalm 22, verse 14 says in part, I am poured out like water. Jesus poured out his life for us. 
And this specifically is saying he poured out his lifeblood for us as a drink offering would be poured out. So he was basically offering to God his own blood as a sacrifice to cover and forgive our sin. So that's the ultimate drink offering. Now Paul also could have meant a Roman idea here because every Roman meal ended with a small sacrificial ritual to the gods. A cup of wine was taken and poured out before the gods. And of course Paul knew that not everyone who read it would have been a believer, so it could have been he meant that. Most likely he meant what we would call the biblical interpretation. But the Roman idea could serve as a double meaning, and it's not, I wouldn't put it past Paul to mean both, okay, because both do apply. But in this sense, using the drink offering being poured out, Paul is saying the day is done, the meal's just about over, and I'm being poured out unto God. And we can get this because of what Paul wrote next. And the time of my departure is at hand. A modern interpretation would be this. Paul felt he's in the airport, and his flight to heaven was ready to depart. He's just waiting for the boarding call. And having traveled recently, I know what that means. You've got to get to the gate <laughs> to get onto the plane, and you've got to have your ticket punched, right? Have it ready. In uh, my case, it was a thing on, was it on my phone? I think it was, because, yeah, one was printed here, but the other one in New York we couldn't print because we didn't have access to a printer without paying for something. Because you don't get hardly anything in New York without paying for it. So <laughs> on our cell phones, it was kind of weird. Boop, get it scanned. But anyway, that's where the status Paul is in. He's just waiting for the plane to be boarded. The word departure, this is the only time this Greek word is used in the Bible. It means this. In this application, it means a metaphor drawn from loosing from moorings, preparatory to setting sail, or departure from life. It was also used to mean the unyoking of an ox at the completion of a hard day's work. Also meant this, taking down of a traveler's tent, because it's time for him to move on. And finally, it was a philosopher's term signifying the solution of a problem. So the problem was the constant opposition that Paul faced. The solution Paul went to be with the Lord forever. As my friend used to say, I still remember it from grade school, pretty good deal, huh? <laughs> pretty good deal. The work of Christians did not stop with the death of Paul the Apostle. It's not like Christianity shut down, folded up, closed up, as some faiths do when their leader dies. Well, Paul knew he wasn't the leader. He's a follower just like the rest of us. When Paul eventually did depart, Timothy would need to take over for him. Because God's workmen pass on, but God's work continues. And that's proven in this verse, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. This is from the New Living Translation. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. One day, all of us Christians will depart to be with the Lord. Until then, we got work to do. There are people, there's a, a group, a Christian band, I don't know if they're still around as a band, um, now I'm trying to remember what their name was, but anyway, they had a song called, uh, I think it was Jeff Moore in the Distance, but they had a song called Home Run, and what, they, what one line says, I got some people on bass, I got to get home, and so the pitch comes, that's a problem, or that's, a, that's a thing you face, and swing the bat and hit the ball, and then the guys get to score, they get to come home participating. He, he says, I didn't join this team to sit on the bench. That's what he, one of the lines too. It's pretty cool. You have stuff to do. Now, if verse 6 applies to you, if you've been poured out as a drink offering, and if you feel maybe the time of your departure is at hand, this is how you should feel about your life in verse 7. I have fought the good fight. Rather, Paul often used sports metaphors. Here he's using a boxing type of metaphor. And he carries that on also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll be going to 1 Corinthians, uh, quoting 1 Corinthians 9 a lot. But in verse 26, Paul said, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. He doesn't shadow box. He doesn't swing and, and miss. Okay? Paul was not that type of fighter. He knew he didn't have time to waste with messing around while he was sharing the gospel. He had a real sense of urgency about him. 
And he didn't pull any punches either. You ever notice that? <laughs> Man, sometimes you read that and you feel like Paul just boom, personally popped you in the gut. But I will say this. Paul knew the right kind of punches to throw at the right kind of people. And he explains that in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. Even though he was a Jew, but he would act more like a Jew and present himself as that. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, is how he presented himself. Not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. What he's saying is, if you guys are under the, aren't under the law, then I'll present myself not under the law. The law means the Ten Commandments, what God says, the standard of behavior that Moses laid out. And then he says, if, if, you, you, if you are by the law, then I'll be by the law. If you aren't by the law, then I'll live with you as if you're not by the law, as if I'm not either. Now, obviously, I still have to obey the Ten Commandments, but I don't have to do it to appease God. I'm already appeased. God is already appeased on my behalf because of what Jesus did. So he's fitting in however the situation presents itself to him. He says, to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. See, Paul was also a realist. He doesn't say I become all things to all men, but by all means I could win them all. Because he knows that there are some people, no matter what you do, their hearts are set against God. They don't want him. It doesn't matter how logical it is. It doesn't matter how you present it. You could even get them to agree you're right, and they're still not going to believe in it. And there's nothing you can do. And we grieve over them. We sorrow. So Paul was a realist, but he presented himself however he needed to to win as many. Now, obviously, he knows that he didn't win any of them, right? Really, it's Jesus who wins them over. But you've got to present it in a way. I've had guys say, man, you make a good case. I'm like, well, it's a good book, dude. <laughs> got a pretty good author. <laughs> he explains himself really clearly. All you got to do is check it out. But anyway, the key verse is at the end of verse 22. Become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now, he did this without compromising the message of the gospel, which can never happen. But Paul adjusted his delivery of the gospel. Okay. That's okay. As I've said, I think everything in the Bible except hell and the cross, you can have fun with. You can explain it in a way that can make people laugh in order to bring the point home. Because you can, if you can make people laugh, their emotions are involved. And if their emotions are involved, they tend to remember things better. And you can also, if you make them laugh, then you can pop them in the gut with a tough point because they go, oh, that hurt, but man, it was fun, you know? <laughs> I've had people say that, God, you make it so much fun. And you know what I say? Because it is. I think the Bible is fun. You know, and it's not just because it's my job description to study it and read it and to pray for you guys and to pray for all number of things. It's because I truly believe, because if you know me at all, you know I like to have fun. I like to goof. I like to kid. I like to watch movies. I like to laugh. Would I devote my entire, the rest of my life as far as, you know, obviously I put the Lord first and I put my family second and this church is third. Sorry, guys, but that's just the way it is. But would I devote that much time to something that's boring and dull and stupid? No, other people might think it is, but it's not. It's not. I think serving Jesus is the most fun I've ever had. I don't mean just serving him as I did my whole life. I mean, like, making my life's work serving him. He's the best boss I've ever had. Now, when I went to New York, he went with me. You know, I didn't get to go on vacation away from my boss. But I thought that was pretty cool because he protected us. Nothing bad happened to us there. The only bad thing is, if you guys know, my, my glasses have these little magnet things in them, and I stick my sunglasses on, this really cool thing. I left it on the plane. My daughter says, did everybody check their seat back? Yep, I did for the stuff that I could see. It fell to the bottom. So I filed a missing, what do you call it, lost and found thing. I might get them back. But if that's all that happened that was bad, that's a good deal. I kept looking for an alley. The you know, guy with a gun is going to point it at us. There are no alleys there. You know why? Because that's bare ground they can't make any money off of. <laughs> I mean, there are alleys in New York, but all the places we went, it was just building stuck to building to building to building. Weirdest thing. I guess they could rob us on the open street. But it didn't happen because my boss went with us. Okay. 
Wow. Focus back. Never compromise the message, but you can adjust the presentation. Paul did it in Acts 17, verses 22 and 23. He's in Athens, and he says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said this, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, which was statue after statue after statue, uh, probably maybe a bust or something, what I call like the Pez Hall of Fame. It's just all these gods lined up. He says, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Now they admitted that there's possibly at least one God that they don't know about. If they have this many, they could have skipped one. They don't want to insult him. So they just pile all the ones we don't know about in the unknown God. Paul said this. Instead of saying, you guys are so stupid. First of all, he's easily known. Secondly, what are you doing with all these other ones? That's a waste of time. All that's true. But what did he say? Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. See what he did? He took their religious thing, built them up, and said, you don't know about this guy? <sighs> Let me tell you about him. This guy's awesome. Puts all the others to shame. But anyway, you know, <laughs> he was so excited, he, he focused the attention on the one they didn't know, because obviously they didn't know him, because if they really knew the real God, they wouldn't have altars to anybody else. So he just met them where they were. And he says he fought the good fight. The word fought means to struggle, literally, to compete for a prize, and figuratively, to contend with an adversary. We do know that Paul competed for a prize from the Lord, not in competition with other believers, but competed as in to keep on going as an athlete does. He was competing against himself. The very best athletes do that. I remember when um, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird first came into the NBA and they hated each other because they played in college and the championship game was in Utah and Magic's team won, so they didn't like each other. And then they finally did a, a commercial together because Converse got them together for the shoes, and they ended up finding out they were really the same. They grew up in Michigan and Indiana, but they had the same values, and they became really good friends, mostly because of Larry Bird's mom, who made lunch for him and forced them to sit down together and eat lunch. And they found out, because then he said he wasn't magic, he was Irvin Johnson. Anyway, so they found out, and then they competed against each other. They both would read... Back then when they had newspapers before the internet, they would read the box score. Oh, so he got 29 last night. Well, I'm getting 30 tonight. You know, they just, they had to have somebody to compete with. But if there's no one to compete with, as a great athlete, the one you compete with is you. Constantly try to outdo yourself. I read about a baseball player. I forget who it was. It might have been Mickey Mantle. But anyway, he grounded out to shortstop and ran as hard as he could to first base. And it was in a game that really didn't mean much. And, someone's, and it was a road game, and someone asked him after the game, why'd you run that ground out so hard? He goes, there might have been somebody here who had never seen me play. He wanted them to know, I'm going to hustle on every play no matter what. Sounds like a Pete Rose quote to me, because even when he walked, he ran to first base. Anyway, Paul says he fought this struggle. He was competing against himself. First, first Corinthians 9, 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize. He says, run in such a way that you may obtain it. What Paul is getting at here is effort. As Christians, we have to put forth an effort in spreading the gospel. The most important effort we can exert is our witness as a Christian, how we live our lives. We have to show the world what living the Christian life means. We are all walking examples of Christianity. Just this morning, my wife and I... Um, went to that fine Scottish establishment, McDonald's, and <laughs> as we drove through, the guy who took our money had a tattoo right in front of his ear here, and it was vertical, and I thought, that's odd, and then I took a look at it, and it said, John 3, 16, right by his ear, and I thought, how fascinating is that? I said, I like your tattoo, and I said, it goes, it goes along with Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. He goes, you understood it. He says, I can't believe how many people I have to explain this to. 
And I thought, but isn't that kind of why you got it? <laughs> to explain it to people? But how many people don't know what John 3.16 is? I said, it's the sign at the football games and stuff. But obviously, it's an opportunity for him to share. But you see, he's prepared to give an answer for his faith. That's the type of thing we have to live it. Do you realize that? If you are a genuine, born-again, Bible-believing, heavenly citizen belonging to God, we sh you should act like it. At times, we should stick out to non-believers, which, as my daughter calls them, not non-believers, but pre-Christians. If you think about people that are non-believers, and you think about them as a non-believer, it's like, dun, dun, dun. But if you think of them as a pre-Christian... Everybody in this room was one time in that camp. All of us were. So we shouldn't be looking down at those who are non-believers because they're really pre-Christian. But anyway, going on. When we do stick out to non-believers, some of them are going to ask us about it. And that's what 1 Peter 3.15 is getting at. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. It means set your heart aside for God. And always be ready to do what? Give a defense to everyone who asks you, a reason for the hope that is in you, and you do it with meekness and fear. You always have to be ready to share the reasons why you are <laughs> when you're at work, when you're at play, when you're walking around the neighborhood at the store. I remember coming in to uh, Simplot's feedlot one time when I was working out there, driving 66 miles a day round trip, making four-something an hour, wading in liquid manure close up to the top of the rubber boots they gave me. And there was a guy there I'd been witnessing to, and he's driving a truck that has a heater and a stereo and a cassette player, and he's got his coffee in a thermos, and I'm out there freezing, and he says, I come into work, and I know that I'm going to have that. You know where you're going to be, and you're way up here, and I'm down here. How does that happen? I said, well, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And he goes, what does that mean? He's so frustrated. But you see, I had an answer. It's because I have a joy in the Lord, and I have a job. I'm excited. I get to barely feed my family with this job. <laughs> I did get discounts on potatoes, you know, the hash browns and the french fries that they make for McDonald's. We could buy a case of them for like five bucks. It was pretty cool. But yeah, I got to have a big freezer to put them in. But anyway, the point is, you just have to live your life knowing that you're a heavenly citizen. You're just still here. And that'll show to other people. The word defense, when he says, get ready to give a defense, you may have heard it before. It's um, apologia, I believe, or apologia is how it's pronounced, but it's verbal defense. It's speech in defense. It's the word from which we get apologetics. So if you ever heard of apologetics, it's not, you a Christian? Yes, I'm sorry. It's not apologizing. <laughs> it's a Greek word that means given a defense, verbally. So not only live your life, but be prepared to share orally how you are feeling this way and why. Be ready for the fight, because there's a fight going on. But are, do we fist fight with people? No. Ephesians 6.12 tells us who we're fighting against. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But it's implied we do wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan, demons, and the fleshly tendencies of non-believers, even the fleshly tendencies of ourselves we have to fight against. Sometimes it's a battle just being prepared to do battle. See, I told Jeff I come in because I'm up here because of the joy of the Lord. He doesn't know that all the way out I'm praying. God, you got to build me up. You got to. I need you. I, just, I hate this job. I hate driving this far. I could. I could stay home and keep the kids home from daycare and only lose like forty bucks a week. I mean, this seems ridiculous for me to go out there. I don't know why. And then I'd pump in Christian music and listen to it. Sweet Comfort Band was one of my favorite bands, and I'd listen to their their music and it would fire me up. He didn't know I had to do that, and I didn't tell him. <laughs> I wanted him to think, you know, I'm up here, but. He found out later, I did talk with him and say, hey, I'm not always this way. But you see it often enough to be curious, to want to know why. And eventually that guy did get saved, so it was pretty cool. Paul says this, keep on keeping on. Now he says, I have finished the race. Here's another sports metaphor, running. 
I think it's interesting to me that of all the sports that we as humans engage in, running against each other is still popular. And I think it's because it doesn't require a uniform, ball, a bat, a stage, a field, a court, a stadium. I mean, we could go outside and run. Well, some of us can. <laughs> I used to love to run. I I, my knee, I can't do it. Anyway, but there are sports that have come and gone. Um, some of them that are mostly gone by now, I think it would be chariot racing as far as like in Roman times, gladiator duels. They had a thing called fox tossing. They take a fox and throw it. They had goose pulling where guys would ride by on horses and try to grab a goose who had been tied up and break his neck, pull his head off. Things like that, you know, probably don't exist a whole lot today. Jousting. <laughs> sticking out the pole and trying to knock the other guy's head off. You know, some of those things have died down. But running a race against others is still here. And Paul's saying he not only ran the race, he finished it. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 again. Do not know that those who run in a race, they all run. But only one receives a prize. Run in a way that you may obtain it. The only way to obtain the prize is to finish the race. And Paul did exactly that. And the Greek word for finished is a form of the Greek word to telestai. If that sounds familiar, it should. In John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, when it was time for him to shut it down, he'd done everything. He said, it is finished. But if you look it up in the Greek, it says, to tell us die, which means paid in full. So when he says he finished the race, he's done all of it. He's completed it. And the race, although this is a sports metaphor, the word is also used in another way. In the New Testament, it means figuratively the course of life or of office. Paul knew he was about to be executed. He's on death row. So he's simply saying he has finished all that God gave him to do in his life. Here's a question, and it applies to me too. How many of us can say the same thing? We've done everything God asks us to do. It's something to think about. He says he has kept the faith. A form of this was very popular, a very popular saying in the 1960s. People would say it when they parted ways. Hey, keep the faith, dude. They might have said dude. I think so. Anyway. I would say that a lot of the people who said it weren't talking about Christianity, though. <laughs> They're probably following Webster's definition, which means to continue to believe in, to trust or support someone or something when it's difficult to do so. Sports teams, political causes, health issues, keep the faith, stay with them. The word Paul used for kept means to hold firmly. So actually, actually, Paul was pretty close to that Webster's definition, to continue to believe in, trust, or support someone or something when it is difficult to do so. Because what was Paul keeping? The faith, which means a strong and welcome conviction or belief that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. Paul held firmly to that. It was clearly a tough time to continue to believe in, trust, or support someone or something especially Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. How tough? Well, he was on death row because of his faith. But he never wavered in it. And eventually, they took his head because of it. Now, if 2 Chronicles 6, 19, or 6 verse 9 applies to you, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him, then this is how the Lord feels about your life. Verse 8, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. There are two main words in the New Testament for crown. One refers to a royal crown, which is a diadem. If you ever hear about a diadem, it means a royal crown, not the cola. And the other is with the victor's crown, which is a stephanos. It's the victor's crown, that stephanos that Paul is referring to here. Jesus wears the diadem crown. None of us is qualified to wear that. His crown shows him as king of kings. And by the way, I specifically did it in one of the songs we sang about the king of kings. And he's the king, capital K of kings, small k. And every time in the Bible when it mentions Jesus, the king is capitalized. And unless it's at the beginning of a sentence, the word king about any other king in the editions that I read, King Josephus, King, you know, make up a name, but King anybody, Solomon, it's a small k. Okay? But that's the type of king Jesus wears the diadem crown. No, we get the victor's crown. 
which is defined as this, the wreath or garland which was given as a prize in victors, or to victors in public games. But metaphorically, the eternal blessedness which will be given as a prize to the genuine servants of God in Christ, the crown or wreath, which is the reward of the righteous. Back in the ancient games, when you won some, they didn't have gold, silver, bronze medals. They put a wreath on their head. And if you remember back when Athens hosted the Olympic Games years ago, they actually brought that back and put the wreath. They got the medals too, but they put that wreath on their head. And I thought it was actually kind of cool. Thought, That's nice. That's the type of thing. The type of crown that this word described is like that. And it, but those eventually wilt and dry up, right? In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, it speaks of a Stephanos, the victor's crown, those, those that run in that race. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. They do all that training, all that preparing for that crown that they get put on their head that wilts and crumbles and turns crunchy and goes away. We prepare and then compete for a crown that we're going to get from the Lord that is imperishable. And this verse begins with, um, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. It begins with, finally, there is laid up for me. That means that God had a reward laid up for Paul just waiting for his arrival in heaven. I think that's pretty cool. And Paul knew it too. And how do I know that? Because the next part of the verse, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Whatever day it is that those are handed out, he's going to give it to me. Right after his execution from an earthly court, Paul would be rewarded in a heavenly court. I love that. And this is where we'll turn to Hebrews chapter 11. If you marked it, this would be when you'd turn there. And we'll pick it up in verse 32. The author of Hebrews through this whole chapter has been listening person after person after person after person coming through with great faith. And then he says in 32, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson, and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the force, the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Those are all heroic and wonderful and great outcomes. Now here comes the nasty stuff. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Isn't that amazing? The world looks at him as something to just trash and throw away. And the author of Hebrews says, man, these people, the planet, didn't deserve them. Because that's how God saw them. All these people received a Stephanos, that victor's crown. So Paul knew he's getting one. These people in Hebrews chapter 11 were getting one. Well, back in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse verse 8, what about us? It says, Paul says, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Guess what? If you love Jesus, if he's your Savior and Lord, and you're eagerly anticipating his return for us, his return for you, you too will receive a Stephanos, the victor's crown. And then just in case you think, your crown might be bigger than someone else's or theirs might be bigger than yours because they did more and they have more jewels or whatever. Guess what? As soon as we see Jesus, we're going to take him off and throw him toward him like, I don't deserve this. (laughs) It's all about him. But it's pretty cool that he's going to reward us for doing things that he prompts us and enables us to do to begin with. So amazing. So I asked you at the beginning of this message, how does your fuel gauge read? Does it read empty? Or does it read full? With a willingness to be empty. There it is. If the Lord needs it to be. In other words, you have to be constantly filled. When it says, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be 
filled with the Holy Spirit. It actually means be you being filled. It's a constant process. He fills you, and then you pour yourself out to him. And then he fills you, and you pour yourself out. So you have to be full, but you have to be willing to be poured out. And at the end of your life, though you feel full because you are in him, you're also poured out because that's the last thing you do at the end of your life. So the question again, how does your fuel gauge read? Well, it's up to you, isn't it? Because God's ready to fill it and then pour you out. <laughs> and then refill you and then pour you out and refill you and pour you out. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for filling us, for providing us with such a great example as the Apostle Paul, who was not perfect, had problems, had mistakes. Before he knew you, he murdered people that were just like what he became. And even afterwards, he made mistakes. But he knew one thing. What he'd done before, he left in the past, and he pressed on. And he would get filled by you, and he would pour himself out in any way necessary in order that one person would be saved. I pray, Lord, that that would inspire us to be willing to be poured out, knowing that we can't get back what we pour out, but at the same time, you always refill us. So thanks for being there, Lord. Thank you for loving Paul. Thank you for loving us. Once again, we lift up Susanna to you, Susanna Lemberg, that you would just heal her. There's something even harder for us to focus on, to process, is when a little tiny one is sick. We know that you love her. So I pray that you just make her better or make, provide the way for them to deal with it in a way that brings glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen.